Hello and welcome back to Sean in the Shed. And on the show today, we've got Steve Phillip, who is the founder of the Jordan Legacy. Welcome to the show, Steve. Hello, Sean. Good to good to be here. As we traditionally do, we always talk about where you were born and started out uh, in your career. So perhaps you can share that with the audience to start us off. Uh, yes. Well, people ask, often ask where I'm from, and it's a difficult question to ask, answer as uh, I currently and have for a good uh, 15 years or so live in Harrogate uh, in North Yorkshire um, of originally Yorkshire stock that moved to Lancashire that saw my father join the police force in Bedfordshire and me born in Luton. Um, so having been brought up in the Bedfordshire and then East Anglia area, uh, I moved to the Lake District to start a career in the hotel and catering industry in the 70s. Uh, to then meet my first wife there uh, and establish um, our family living in Morecambe before emigrating to Canada and living in the frozen prairie wastes of Winnipeg for several years before coming back to the UK in the late 90s and uh, and then subsequently fairly shortly afterwards getting divorced actually and uh, ended up moving to Harrogate. So when people ask me where I'm from, um, it's a bit of a difficult question to uh, to answer really. Steve, um, it's been all almost a year now since something that's profoundly changed <clears throat> your life, and perhaps you know you can open up and just describe that journey uh, to the audience if you don't mind. Yeah, certainly. I mean, if you look at my my career, which has been predominantly in sales in the automotive industry for many years, and then in consultancy. So in North America, when I was over in in Canada, I ran a couple of General Motors franchises. Uh, came back to the UK, got involved in consultancy, and uh, about 11 years ago, I uh, started a business uh, that had nothing to do with automotive uh, or sales per se, but um, through stumbling over LinkedIn, of all things, on not being a, a social media user or a millennial, which you can tell from looking at me even 11 years ago, um, I stumbled across LinkedIn, and as a lot of my coaching work I used to do with clients was around personal branding and um, I saw an opportunity to to use LinkedIn to help people communicate much more effectively as professionals online that led to me founding a business called link to success of which uh, 11 years I ran that for and almost 12 months ago uh, now on December the 4th I was just leaving a large automotive group in the Midlands having delivered a social media workshop for them that day, um, got into my car, uh, about to drive back from Solihull, um, back to Harrogate. And as I put my phone into the holder on the dashboard, I saw Charlotte's name appear on the screen. It was Jordan's girlfriend. Answered that call, and in that instant, my life changed as through tears and everything else that was going on. She told me she'd come back to Jordan's house, my son, 34 years old and um, found him in the home and he'd taken his own life. So that's <clears throat> that's really tough. That's tough. And and you've set up you've set up the Jordan legacy um in his name. So talk us about what your life's mission now is is truly focused on. Yeah, well, I say it is a complete change. And just very recently, I finally stopped the consultancy business that I've been running for 11 years. Um, like most people, um, yeah, I've had a, a period of uh, challenging times, I suppose, with no income coming in for the family. But that kind of started in January when I pulled away from the business and, and, and took obviously some time out. And just as I came back, uh, of course, we then went into the first lockdown in March, so that kind of compounded it. But uh, I carried on through the summer uh, as I had, I suppose, a reputation on LinkedIn and, and globally for the work that I did. So I did carry on with some work, but I, th I think the catalyst for the big change really was that three weeks after losing Jordan, um, a good friend of mine said, you, Steve, you, you should write down what's going on in your life and what's happening. He said, you're probably going to want at some point to look back at this for whatever reason, but just trust me, start writing this down. And one of the first things I did was to try and make sense of everything that was happening to us as a family, um, uh, the, the issues within the first few days, not even knowing where they'd taken Jordan, the police and the coroner's office we were dealing with and, you know, a complete mess, to be honest. Um, um, I, I started to make all these notes and 
three weeks later, I, I, I just thought I'm going to share the story that, that, you know, what is it like to suddenly get that call one day? What happens immediately afterwards? What is the knock on and ripple effect that, in fairness, was only just beginning at that stage, but I hadn't realized it. Um, what if I was to write that story and share it? What would that help somebody? Would that help a family going through this? Would this stop someone doing the same? So I published an article on LinkedIn on December the 16th. Um, it was some 12 days days later then, really. And um, in LinkedIn terms, went viral, um, led to me receiving messages from the likes of Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post in, in the States to psychologists, to people that had lost loved ones to suicide, to um, people that were considering suicide. And just say, look, I've read your article. I've seen the impact. I've changed my mind. I've just decided I'm not going to do it. And I think in that moment, Sean, what happened was I, I kind of realized I knew I had a voice on LinkedIn anyway, had had for a number of years. Um, but suddenly this was a voice that was going to be used for a very different purpose. And I talked to the family. I said, I think I need to do something here. Um, but look, I'm getting messages from people that are thinking they're taking their own lives. I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to advise them. What am I supposed to do? And I had two experts in the family. I had Jordan's mother, my first wife, um, we, we divorced some 15 years ago, who'd been a senior mental health nurse for many years. And sadly, Jordan's girlfriend, uh, Charlotte, who um, was just about to qualify as a um, clinical forensic psychologist at that time. Um, the good news is literally yesterday, she put and submitted her thesis having got back into it now this year and, and should become Dr. Charlotte Heathcote in the new year. So out of the ashes, if you like, has, has come a, a really positive story just in the last 24 hours. But we had the expertise and, and uh, I said, look, how do I advise people? What do I do? So my, my knowledge of mental health was 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 zero. Um, Jordan, I knew it had clinical um, diagnosis of depression since 2015. Did I really know what that meant? No. Um, did I know how to deal with it if he was struggling? No, um, I was just dad. Um, suddenly I went on this tremendous learning curve and established the Jordan Legacy as a website, mainly to signpost people initially, but that has now moved on significantly with the partners that I'm now working with and the network of people I've been able to pull around me globally where we are just launching now um, what we're calling our Zero Suicide community strategy and the emotions that you've been on an emotional roller coaster <clears throat> from you know the start to where you are now um what what were the emotions and, and what were the thoughts going through your head i mean there'll be a lot of anger a lot of negativity and then how you turn that negativity in into something positive that will make a difference for other people in the future yeah, I mean, firstly, uh, and, you know, very conscious of the fact the anniversary is coming up this this Friday. Um, I've taken a spot of leave now. This is one of just a couple of events I've got this week. But, um, you know, already some of the anxiety that I um, suffered in the beginning has started to come back and, and that's happening in the family. But I, I can tell you for the first few months, you know, I was on sleeping medication. Um, I would have everything from physical head twitching to body lurching, which were the physical um, signs of stress and anxiety um, and you know the huge emotion and the whys and the questions uh, you know that you're bound to have particularly when you know you lose a child but you lose a child to suicide or, or lose anyone um, but one of the things I suppose you know a lot of people have said how, how have you managed to kind of do and relatively quickly in their minds at least do what you've done in this time and I think in lots of ways, Sean, I was um, prepared over many years for this um, as, as someone who uh, has been a professional coach, um, someone who's been a lot into personal development through my life. I, I like to consider myself reasonably self-aware, reasonably able to put things in boxes and, and, and deal with them, even though I am you know, a hugely emotional person. I've certainly discovered that this year. So the work that I do now, um, people ask me, how do you do it? 
you know, you, you consider that, that everything I write, everything I do, every workshop I'm delivering mentions Jordan's name. So that's going to be 50, 100 times a day. But it's in a little box over here for me while I'm working on it. And I, it's almost like a project. Um, and I get on with it and I'm able to put it into that compartment and work on it. And then I have my own kind of demons when I'm by myself and other occasions. And life isn't like that 100% now, 12 months on. You know, we can watch telly, we can have a bit of a laugh, we can have a joke. But there are, it's always there with you because that, that kind of what I would describe as a, as a whole is always there and it can be just a moment in between you know a tv program or whatever there, there isn't a moment where you don't think about uh, what's happened um and and talking with others i don't think that ever really goes goes away you just learn to manage it um a little bit more effectively as, as time goes on i think and I think when we talk about things such as suicide and mental health, uh, there can be sometimes a bit taboo in the past in, in prior decades. But people like Prince William and Prince Harry have brought it to the forefront as, you know, now it's perhaps a, more acceptable to be uh, talking about it and, and trying to encourage people uh, to be open. But when we look at the statistics of suicide, for example, um, young men um, within a particular age range, uh, are mostly affected. Perhaps you can just share some of those stats or what you've learned on this journey because you have been scratching your head around the whys, the wherefores, the statistics, and really, uh, I guess, studying the whole topic, really, so that you can positively form the future to pre prevent such suicides, I suppose. Yeah, very much. I mean, that is my my mission now. And, and you know, I learned very early on that, that um, the um, – World Health Organization statistics say that 800,000 people take their own lives every year globally. That's one person every every 40 seconds. Uh, I can tell you there's a cost to the UK economy of, of the deaths we have here by suicide of 1.7 million pounds per suicide. 60 to 70 percent of that is spent on the bereaved, those that are left behind to provide counselling and support services for them. The highest percentage of suicides are male, 75%. And the highest age range of suicides are the uh, kind of 45 to 49 age group. But we know there's a, sh you know, behind that, you're looking at this group aged just over 30 to 50 on the wider spectrum. Um, and you're right in terms of taboo, you know, the term stigma, of course, is used. And there is still a, a lot of stigma around talking about mental health particularly for for males but i do take the point that you know there's been a lot of increased awareness through the work that prince william is doing and and you know the, the government in fairness over recent years have, have, have put this on the agenda the the challenge is is this though sean is that the awareness is one thing having a, a system uh, or being able to practically prevent suicides is a whole different ball game and where we're at now is that it's, we need to stop just being aware that it's happening and we need to now, A, significantly improve our mental health systems to, to stop people slipping through the net. Um, and we also, I think, as communities, that's us and as business people and, and, and communities, need to be more aware of the signs and we need to understand what it is you know, we can do um, you know, if we're concerned to prevent people taking that ultimate step, really. If you've just joined us, you're watching Sean in the Shed. And on the show today, we've got Steve Phillip, who's the founder of the Jordan Legacy. And we're talking about mental health. So if you've got uh, people and friends, family that might be interested in this video, do uh, share share it with them. Uh, you can hashtag share Sean in the Shed on social media. And we are looking for future guests of the show. So if you're interested, do direct message me here. Uh, on LinkedIn. But the question that myself and Steve would like to ask you, the audience today, is what are the signs to look out for when you are concerned about someone's mental health? If you've got questions, answers, opinion, or ideas on that, do fill in the comment stream here. Um, and uh, I'd like to fire that question back to yourself, Steve. What are those telltale signs? How, how can you deduce that somebody uh, is downtrodden, depressed, not happy? How do you detect that change? And then I guess the follow-on question from that is then how, once you are armed with that knowledge, how do you approach that difficult situation? 
Yeah, well, I, I, so I suppose there's no surprises that most of us are struggling to one degree or another, Sean, at the moment with the lockdown and the pandemic. No, no one's having a, a well, not everyone certainly is having a ball at the moment. So we know there's an increase um, risk um, um, and, and certainly evidence of, of people struggling with mental health of all age ranges at the moment from university students right the way through. Um, but um, I, I suppose you know, what are the signs we're looking out for? And I can relate some of this to, to Jordan now and, and conversations that I was having with him in the last few weeks, some of them on WhatsApp, some of them, you know, telephone conversations. But um, I think if, if, if you know someone reasonably well, it's going to be a lot easier to work out whether you uh, can see signs that they're struggling with their mental health. So this could be a work colleague. This could be someone that you know personally or someone in the family. First thing you're looking for is, you know, have you noticed consistently over recent uh, um, days and weeks, usually a period of at least a couple of weeks, that their behaviour has changed? Um, in the main, you're you're going to uh, experience that um, that they may be a little bit more lethargic than they've been for a while. They're not as outgoing. They're not responding to messages as they did before. If you're having regular Zoom calls, they're, they're that person that was maybe a little livelier on each of the previous team meetings, but suddenly they're much quieter, they're, they're more withdrawn on those meetings. If you're close to this person and you see, you know, their eating habits have changed, particularly if they're, they're not eating, but equally they could be overeating, you know, it, it can go either way. So do also look out for people that are displaying what we would maybe once upon a time call more manic behaviours. Um, not just with withdrawing, but typically they'll, they'll be withdrawing from social interactions. One of the key signs is people sleeping poorly. Um, and as I said, I relate some of this to Jordan because, you know, I now look back at some of the WhatsApp messages I had with him in the weeks leading up. And, you know, regularly he was saying to her, I'm just not sleeping well, I'm struggling to sleep. And, you know, back then that just meant he was struggling to sleep. I know now it is one of the absolute signs of someone who's struggling with their mental health if, if, if you've got very poor sleep um, happening there. The days where he said, you know, um, we, I remember laughing and joking a little bit on WhatsApp with him where he said, oh, at least I managed to get up and have a have a shave and a wash today. Dan. Now, we had a bit of a banter, you know, on WhatsApp. And I said, well, that's good, Joe. To me, you know, if I'm in a time machine now going back, I'm over to his house. Because he's told me he's struggling yeah. to sleep and he's told me that he's obviously been struggling to get up and have a wash and a shave. If he can't get out of bed and have a wash and a shave, then there's something seriously wrong here. So I think, you know, it would be a combination of things, but certainly where you're seeing a distinct change in behaviours, um, that should prompt you to take action. And that was your second question, really, Sean. What do we do? Do we, you know, we don't run off to a, you know, the, the doctors or phone Samaritans on their behalf or do anything like that. I, I think it's about um, being confident enough to have the conversation and ask what may be quite a difficult question. I think that comes, you know, there's maybe one or two difficult questions to ask, but the first one is relatively easy once you ask it. Um, but leading up to it, they're all that much more difficult. So if I was having a conversation with you and I'd maybe noticed some of the characteristics I've mentioned, I might just be saying to you in a conversation, how, you know, at whatever point I felt it was appropriate. Um, look, how, how are you doing at the moment, Sean? Now, let me ask you, Sean, for the average man out there that you ask that question, how are you doing? What's their response going to be? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm doing OK. Now, you know, you've been seeing things or experiencing things where you think I'm not convinced by that answer. So you either walk away and go, oh, he's fine, I've kind of asked the question, or you dig a little deeper. And and when I wrote this question in that first article I published, I had a number of people say, I've gone away to people I knew were struggling, and I've asked them this question, the next question, and it's opened up, and they've told me what's going on. And the next question is very simply, okay, I hear what you're saying, Sean, but let me ask you, how are you really doing? and you shut up and you listen and nine times out of ten if there is an issue that person is going to stop and think couldn't think well he's not going to let me off the hook here and he genuinely wants to know it's not just a how are you doing throwaway question 
Um, and in that case, you're hopefully going to get the person to um, to open up. From there, it, it is about um, listening. Um, I, I think listening without judgment, really important. Listening without wanting to leap in with a solution, even more important, irrespective of your knowledge background, unless you are a trained medical professional in the mental health arena, of course, that may be a little bit different. But don't put any judgment on it. Don't make any recommendations at this stage. But I think just ask them if, of course, through that conversation, you really are starting to get concerned. I think you've got to ask one more important question, and this is the, the tough one. And and um, that question is very simply: Look, can I ask you? Is it is it bad enough that you are considering self harming in any way, or even taking your own life? And that is the tough question, and that is the question I wish I'd asked Jordan. And none of us did, not even his mum, who's a mental health nurse, and uh, because. We were kind of alluding to this before we came on air. When you're that close to somebody, as a mother, you become a mother, not a mental health nurse. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to, with the bond and the relationship, uh, because you don't want to mess that relationship up. But if you have concerns, you ask that question. I think it's really, really um, important. And, and just in case there's any people who've listened to any of the myths that by asking that question, you put the thought in that person's head. All those myths have been dispelled. It's not true at all. If the thought's there, it's already um, in their head there. But yeah, re really, really important um, those those questions are asked. And um, I, I guess when you're having that conversation, it's best done face to face, of course, with social distancing and, and and what's going on at the moment it's it's harder to do that so if you're not able to meet the person face to face is it a phone call how do you approach it do you go to the garden i i think well a couple of important things here because uh, confidentiality is important um i think when you're having this discussion so it could be on the phone um i think you'll just find yourself in that situation to be honest if you, if you usually speak to that person by phone it's probably going to be by phone if it's usually by zoom it's by zoom so i think it's whatever you would normally do uh, you know i don't think you're going to book a zoom call to say can I chat with you about your mental health uh, it'll be what it is i think it's very important though that, that if you're using a remote uh, method of communication like that, that that when you you you're about to ask that question um or you ask you know how you're really doing that you just ask look is anyone else with you at the moment uh is anyone else in the room you know just just double check because i want to ask you something look how are you doing and then how are you really doing so just 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 check whether they are with anyone else because that a you will maybe make it very awkward for them to explain and therefore you kind of failed in your mission if you like there um but but also the you know the you, you've got to be equally careful, I suppose, who you've got in your own earshot while you're having this conversation that might know them as, as well. So I think it works both ways. You want this to be as private as, as, as it possibly can be there. And it's also tricky, I guess, around the timing and, and, and also you can't just go straight into that. So you need to do, I guess, some small talk. Is the advice to do some small talk at the start of the conversation or straight into it? What's, what's your view on that? Uh, well, again, I, I think it depends on the situations. If, if you know the person re reasonably well, you, you're going to have, um, um, uh, you know, I, I think the situation that we're, we're talking about is a situation where you have an idea that something not right. Um, so you've created this call um you know it'd be good to have a chat let's have a catch up but in the back of my, your mind you know that there's an issue there so you maybe will have that just whatever you would normally have as an opening bit of chat with that friend or loved one um, and if it was me at that stage i'd go look let me tell you one of the reasons for the call i just want to ask how you're doing and then we go through that process i mentioned before um if it is a work situation with a colleague it, it depends on the relationship you have. So if you're a line manager, for example, you, you could probably do it in a slightly more formal but caring way where I may say, sure, can I just have a couple of minutes with you? Just want to have a chat with you. Um, you know, pop up and just go to the coffee room or 
try not to make it too formal with a big desk and all that. So in that case, you'd probably act a little bit, a little bit differently, um, but still, obviously, in a very caring and compassionate way. So, so yeah, I, I think you'll you'll know at the time how you would normally approach that that person. But but clearly, we're not we're not going to kind of say, look, can I give you a chat later to talk about your mental health? We're not going to you know clearly do that, but. Um, that, that would be my suggestion for how you would approach it. And there will be plenty of instances where this mental health is undetected. And I guess the lesson for us all in those instances is just to lead with kindness as a default, isn't it, in our lives? So that, you know, it's quite easy to ruffle feathers sometimes and upset people, especially when business is tough and things aren't going well. But to just to take a step back and a pause and to, and to try and treat other people as we would like to be treated ourselves so that if it is undiagnosed or not detectable and, and we're not aware at least then there's that 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 that, that kindness that you know uh, maybe just make somebody day and 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 become you know compliment people and, and praise people a little little bit more often perhaps show, show that love i suppose is it i mean how, uh, how I, you I, I think that's really important sure what you've said there is massive um because i think we all do need to uh, you know the, the truth is that you know, particularly with a complete stranger, you've no idea what people are going through. And it's kind of, it has changed my view. You know, I used to, I never had road rage per se, but if someone cut me off or was driving, you know, too slow to, you know, whatever, but I always complain and have a whinge. I kind of have a slightly different view now. Don't get me wrong, I still have my moments, but, um, but, but my view generally with people is different now because I, I kind of always think, look, I don't know what's maybe going on you know, if that was me behaving irrationally on December the 4th and 5th and 6th and, you know, a year ago, and I behaved out of character, if people knew why, they'd understand. But a lot of people would have had no idea what was what was going on. Um, so I think kindness is really, really important. And um, I think if we can just understand that that person in front of us may have stuff going on that we have no idea about and therefore let's let's just treat them that little bit kinder uh, with more consideration then yeah yeah and i think the important message there is and i just picked this up from a suicide prevention conference i was on last week is we will never know what that act of kindness has done for that person at that moment but it might just be the difference between them still being here today or not tomorrow. I guess the irony of all of this is that usually someone's house is their castle. We don't know what goes on between the four walls of a person's house, but now with Zoom calls and live video streaming, we're, we're peering into people's houses all the time. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud, are, are there instances where, you know, perhaps someone's been on camera, being quite buoyant, like you say, and then they're, you know, turning the camera off, they're being more silent. And and so so I think it's a very complicated um, issue is mental health. I think the key, what would you say the key to it, uh, unlocking the doors, is, is about, about us all being as open as we can be and a, a problem shared is a problem ha halved. We're all different types of personalities. Some people are more open than others. Some people are very private individuals. There is no silver bullet, but if there was a silver bullet, what is the silver bullet for this big issue that is now your life's work? Yeah, I, I you know, I, we hear, of, uh, you know, these statements now, it's good to talk and um, and it's not weak to speak and, and all that. And, and, and I think sometimes we get a little overloaded with seeing these. They almost kind of lose their impact, but, but they are true. Um, but sometimes we get a little blind to it because we see it so often on an Instagram post or a Facebook post or wherever it may be. Um, but I, I think one of the things we have to start doing is being more open and talking about our mental health in the same way we would do our physical health. Because, because the two are, you know, largely linked to, to a large degree, you know, that, that, that if, if we are in much better physical health, we have an increased chance of having much better mental health. Uh, if our mental health is poor, that will often lead to poor physical health as well. So, you know, the, the two will often go very hand in, in hand. Um, so I think if we were just more open to say, if I'm suffering, look, I, I am just struggling today. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot of changes in, in, in a number of workplaces now, particularly where they're creating that culture where they are saying, 
if you are generally you know having a bad time and you need to go away and have a break or pop home or do do whatever um just come and let us know and and, and go you know we you know we'll, we'll sort it we'll get it all sorted out um and i think companies have to be prepared to be more flexible um and you know gosh it's not that long is it since um you know women having babies were, were frowned upon for being pregnant at work and, you know which is ludicrous when you think about it now and and, and would they get a job based based on the fact they might get pregnant well you know you could almost argue would people get a job on the fact that they maybe have some pre-diagnosed mental health issue or might have one um you know nowadays you know hopefully in more and more workplaces women uh, are catered for they're recognized for who they are and their skills and abilities and they may have a family well that's life um equally anyone within the workplace could experience a mental health problem at some point from the very top down i can tell you there's a lot of senior people who will be and uh, you know experiencing mental health problems that their workforce don't know about well, if leadership, in my view, is about emotional intelligence, a great leader to maybe open up within the workplace and say, we're going to do more here to look after the mental well-being of our employees. Let me start by sharing my story. You know, what a great leader that would be. So I think talking, definitely without question, creating an environment and a culture where I feel I won't be judged in any way or embarrassed if I come forward and say I'm, I'm struggling at the moment that's where we need to get to that that is a silver bullet for sure as we come towards the end of the show we've got a bit of a tough three to six months ahead before the vaccine comes out so for getting through the both the health and economic issues what would your top three tips be for getting through the next um couple of months yeah, really, really important. Uh, you know, a lot of people are locked in to the houses. Some are going, oh, I'm quite enjoying this, but but actually maybe still still kind of locked in and, and without real realising, you know, may may end up creating longer uh, health uh, issues for themselves longer. Um, I, I think I think one of the things is looking after your physical well-being. I'm a keen cyclist. I get on the bike as often as I can do, but it's very easy for me sometimes to spend long hours behind a laptop um and suddenly realize you know that i've been sitting here for, for two or three hours uh we know that sedentary behavior can lead to all kinds of physical illnesses from diabetes to heart disease and all kinds um and um you, you know realistically we we shouldn't be sitting down at a desk like this for periods of much longer than 30 40 minutes at a time without at least getting up having a walk around doing some stretches or something and i now actually set my alarm on my phone every 30 to 40 minutes when i'm working at my desk to remind me just to get up otherwise i'd be two or three hours um and i've had i've talked to directors about this and said well, i've just had a day where i've sat 12 hours behind my desk so i said so you've not got up you're not stretched you're not done anything so if you continue that pattern all the evidence suggests uh, that you are you know ripe for heart disease cardiovascular issues um diabetes and all kinds so physical exercise get out for a walk break your day up book it in as an appointment with yourself to do something to look after your physical well-being really important and um, i think alongside that as well do you know do similar exercise your mental health muscles as well so whether that's just having a break to do a spot of reading some quiet meditation mindfulness uh, all things i'm not doing by the way um but i think if you can if that's your thing and that works for you as well or maybe both just make sure you're making some time for yourself to look after your own well-being it's really important build it Book an appointment with yourself. I think that's really, I've always talked about that with businesses, any kind of self-development you're doing, book it into your diary because it's important for you in the long term. I think the second thing I'd say is keep connected. Really, really important. It's very easy to become very isolated. Make a point of um, contacting a friend, a family member, um, at least a few times a week. So you're having that, that kind of social interaction and so it's not all just business calls um all day long uh, very easy to lose that social connection so keep connected um and the third point really um I, I, that i jotted down was was really what we've just covered before um and that is that if you feel you're 
struggling and you'll know the signs you'll you'll maybe dismiss them as i'm just a bit tired or or not had a holiday for a while but but if you're seeing that you're overeating you're you're reaching for the bottle and the fridge a little bit more than you did uh before lockdown um if you stop doing that exercise you were doing before if you're not phoning those people or being as social as you were before if you're not sleeping well um those are signs um, and what I do is make sure you have a chat to someone and just say, look, it may be nothing, but I want to have a chat with you, Sean, because I think I might just be struggling a little bit here. Um, I think, you know, talk, really, really important. Um, and as for ourselves, you know, be aware, as we've said, of others and be prepared to talk and ask those difficult questions as well. Steve, some wise words there, very much appreciated. If people want to connect with you after the show, what's the best way? You're clearly on LinkedIn. Is there a particular website they should head to? Yes, absolutely. The uh, jordanlegacy.com uh, is our website. Lots of really useful resources to help people that might be struggling in different ways, as well as, as, as stories. You can subscribe there to a, a newsletter I send out once a month with uh, all kinds of stories about the work that we're doing through the Jordan Legacy to help prevent suicide. Uh, and move towards a zero suicide community, but also um, other good news and positive news stories in there as well. I think it's very important that we're, we're you know, suicide is not the cheeriest topic, I know that only too well, um, but I think out of this has to come hope as well. And through everything that we're looking to do, it is all about achieving some level of hope out of here that we can, you know, save more lives and, and improve the mental well being of, of others along the way as well. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's been heart-wrenching, really, because it's a personal journey that you've been on and to open up and, and put yourself in the spotlight, but for positive good moving forward to prevent suicide in the future and to help others is, is, is courageous leadership for me. It's, it's really brave of you to do. And I think I know it's, you're just starting out and, and I know it's going to be your life's journey now and your purpose to, you, you've wound down your own business to 100% focus on this. So I, I wish you all the best and I thank you so much for your time today. It's been very touching. And uh, I, I think just if, if, if everyone could share their support and do head over to the Jordan Legacy website, I think it's worth some reading on there. I keep thinking about others and keep uh, people in, in best intention, be kind, uh, because it's, it's sometimes easy to be brash. We don't want to do that. We want, through these difficult times, we want to uh, be, be mindful, don't we? Thank you for your time, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. And thank you to the audience for watching Sean in the Shed. We'll be back on during the week. Bye for now.